Good afternoon, everyone. I'm waiting a little bit for people to populate. Uh, maybe, ooh, and the sun is out now after a nice little rain. I hope your garden is singing and happy for the baptism of the rain today. Uh, today we're going to start um, Jonah and probably finish Jonah. It's only four chapters long uh, and is really unique in the Old Testament. Uh, because of the way it is situated and because of its focus on its main character and also um, that it is going to be uh, kind of, it's kind of a parable in itself. Um, I've had some conversation with my rabbi buddies on the police chaplain's corps and they say this is like unlike anything in the Hebrew Bible because it is just a story. It's a teaching story. So you can think of it in terms of uh, like a parable that Jesus would have, have taught. And in fact, it's so important in the Old Testament uh, as a piece of showing about how God loves um, both the chosen people of Israel and other nations, even if they've been misbehaving, that God's steadfast love, that Hebrew word chesed, um, reaches out to those who turn to him and repent and change their ways. So that's an, uh, an essential piece, I think, for us to move forward with. Uh, Jesus refers pretty um, at, at a little bit of length in both in Matthew and in Luke, recalling the story of Jonah and the mercy that is given to uh, the Ninevites, who were the bad guys of the story. Um, so it's an unusual tale in that there are good guys and there are bad guys, but even the bad guys get mercy. Um, so that's, and the good guys are kind of obnoxious. So, so it's kind of a fun little story. And of course, then there are all the wonderful images. And it's one of the reasons why it always lands uh, in children's Bibles and also is almost always taught in Sunday school. So um, here's the, you know, the story of Jonah and the big fish. Uh, the other unique quality of Jonah as a book is that, um, Jonah was a prophet of Israel, uh, but this Jonah is a character in the story. So, you know, like many other of the names in the Bible, we use them over and over again for different people and you kind of have to, you know, pull them apart and separate them. But I want to read to you a little bit about the Jonah, the prophet, um, who's spoken about in second Kings. Um, and this is, would be around, um, a little bit after King David was around the 1000 BC, so around the 700s, 800s BC, um, we had a, um, a prophet named Jonah who is probably model, you know, this story was modeled after Jonah the prophet. Let me read you just a little bit from 2 Kings. In the 15th year of King Amaziah, son of Joash of Judah, King Jero Jero <laughs> Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. He reigned 41 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he caused Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the distress of Israel was very bitter. There was no one left, bond or free, and no one to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Joash. So this is a little bit of the background that we know about the prophet Jonah, who this, as I say, the character of Jonah is modeled after, but this was the big fish and the Nineveh story and all that was not part of the prophet Jonah's story. So we've taken a, a figure from history and given him a, a story that will help the people along to learn things. Very similar to, I, I would say, put this in the classification that we would understand as a legend or a tradition, very similar to the kinds of things where we have stories about George Washington, who we have these little legends about, you know, did you cut down the cherry tree? You know, you know that. You know. So, what do we learn from that? We learn to tell the truth. So, there is a teaching story. It wants to better the community uh, through this character that they would accept immediately. Um, the way we accept, we know oh, George Washington. We know who he who he is, and you know what he's all about. So, 
Um, let's take a minute now. You got that in the back of your head. So I'm going to say an opening prayer and then we'll begin reading in Jonah. Gracious God, once again, we are here this day uh, to study your word and to enjoy the story of Jonah. And uh, we thank you for the fact that we will enjoy Jonah's story much more than Jonah will, um, because it is, it's got a hard word for him. We thank you for the rain and the sun and all of the ways that you feed us through nature and the natural world. We thank you for uh, the flowers and the trees and the fruit and the vegetables that are coming in our gardens these days. But we especially thank you for the seed that you plant of your word in our hearts and in our minds. And we ask that we would receive that not as pathy, not as rocky, not as thorny, but as good soil. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I do hope that you heard Pastor Antony's sermon on the sower in the seed last Sunday. If you did not, please dial it up uh, on the on the uh, either on Facebook or on um, our YouTube channel. You can link to through the website because it was a slam dunk sermon on the sower in the seed. And I think you uh, take some time to read that or to listen to it. So we're in uh, chapter one, verse one. If you have a Lutheran study Bible. Right underneath that first chapter, you've got a little uh, picture, a little map of Jonah's travels. And basically what I want you to notice about this, if you will look at it, is to the right-hand side above the name Assyria is the town of Nineveh. It's on the Tigris River, just over there in the Fertile Crescent um, between the Tigris and the Euphrates Rivers. It was a great city. Um, it was one, and Assyria was the people who had come originally and grabbed the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, um, and taken them off in captivity to Babylon. So uh, the Assyrians were um, people who, who conquered. They just were out conquering peoples and territories. So we have that over there on the right-hand side of the map. Then you see Judah and Joppa. Judah is the southern kingdom, and just above it, there's no mark here, but just above Joppa would have been um, the same as Judah would have been Samaria, or I'm sorry, Israel, okay? So you've got Israel is the northern kingdom, Judah is the southern kingdom. Israel is what was taken away into captivity, and Judah was pretty much what stayed around the city of Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem was destroyed when that happened. So Joppa is one of the cities mentioned in the story of Jonah. And then if you go all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, you see the word at Tarshish and an arrow, actually that way. Um, and it says Spain with a question mark. Tarshish it, it was not the name of the city as we know it in modern day, but basically the idea is that when people said um, they were going to Tarshish, what they meant was they were going to the ends of the earth. Okay, so he was going to run as far as he could get away from God to the ends of the earth to Tarshish. Okay, so just, you know, a little background so that when you hear the story, you'll have some ideas about how this goes. So let me begin. And as always, if you have a question, if it comes up while I'm reading, you know, go ahead and type it in and I'll pick it up as I can. So my headline is Jonah tries to run away from God. <laughs> I like that a lot. Chapter one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came up upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing, sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. 
The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Okay, I want to stop right there um, and pick up some things from from that first couple of paragraphs. Okay, so we have this wonderful, you know, image of the the ship at sea, you know, and the storm gathering and and being around. But there's a couple of wonderful pieces of this that don't worry, you wouldn't have known. Okay, (laughs) these are some things that are just kind of buried here uh, that I think are interesting. Uh, At the beginning of chapter one, we have... um, God saying to Jonah, go at once, in other words, don't fool around here, go at once to Nineveh, that great city, you know, like go to New York City or, you know, go to Rome or some great big city and cry out against it. And the words here are an absolute duplicate of the words that are used in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so Jonah is supposed to go out and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Okay, these are kind of some of the things where we get images of God being in the heavens, because that this news has come up, you know, like up through the clouds and has come to me. So now I understand what's going on. So it's a similar kind of call from God for Jonah to go and get Nineveh to repent for its its evil and wicked ways. But is the key word here. But Jonah, instead of acting like the prophet who goes immediately to do what God has sent him to do, sets out to flee to Tarshish, to the ends of the earth, away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship. And then here's another thing. We have this kind of up and down uh, going on. The word went up to God. And Jonah said, but I'm going to go down. So everything going down now, he's going down, he's going down, he's going down. He went down to Joppa and found a ship and went on board. And then he goes down into the hold where he's sleeping. And then he's going to get thrown down into the sea where he runs into the big fish. Okay, so just, you know, think about the movement of this. The word goes up to God and then Jonah goes down further, further, further until God finally catches him. The other thing is the the word the Lord hurled in verse four. The word he has there is Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and then the uh, mariners threw the cargo. That word threw and hurled is the same word in Hebrew. And then they threw... Um, um, Jonah into the water. So all of this is the same Hebrew word. In other words, the action is the same. God, you know, through the storm, 
and then the Mariners threw the cargo and then they ended up throwing Jonah, you know. So um, what does that make you think of? If you were listening to the sower and the seed, we have God throwing out the seed. Now we have God throwing out a storm, you know, just kind of interesting imagery. So um, just it catch those things. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that are fun to catch. And I know you don't know Hebrew, but that's what I'm for. So I can tell you about these things. So Jonah's down in the in the hold, and while all this tumult is going on up above um, decks, he's sleeping. You know, so it's like he doesn't seem to be too concerned about the fact that he's fleeing from the presence of God. I would think that that would be a place where you would want to go and hide um, as much as you could from the presence of God. Um, but just oh Jonah, but he doesn't seem to be too stressed out about it because he's sleeping, fast asleep. It says. And then the captain comes to him and says, what are you doing sound asleep? You know, we've been calling on our gods and it's not helping. So you call on your God and maybe he will save us so that we don't perish. Uh, so then they do this casting of lots to discover, you know, for sure. They want to make sure um, that it's Jonah before they do anything rash. And, he, and uh, they ask him who he is and where he's from and what he does. And he claims that he's Jewish. Uh, that he's a Hebrew, and he worships the Lord, the God of heaven, so the one God, the one who made the sea and the dry land. Uh, and then the men are even more afraid of him um, because he apparently is affiliated with this creator God, this monotheistic God that I'm sure um, the concept has been in and around uh, during this time. So they are aware that this is the, you know, the one God of the Hebrews. And so they ask him, you know, what do we have to do to appease your God? And Jonah says, well, throw me into the water, you know, give me up as a sacrifice. You see how this, this idea of sacrifice shoots through the Old Testament, whether it's a uh, temple sacrifice or sacrificial uh, death of Jesus that's going to come through the Messiah, through the suffering servant. And here Jonah is saying, you know, sacrifice me to the ocean and everything will be okay. Um, and so basically they do that, and the sea ceases from its raging, and immediately, if this were Mark, it would say immediately, the, the sea ceased. But then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord beyond the sacrifice of Jonah, and made vows. In other words, they believed. Okay, so they vowed now that they would be followers of this, the, the Lord, the God of heaven, the maker of the heavens and the earth. So, got any questions? Oh, you're spellbound by the story, I can tell. No one's writing anything. <laughs> okay, so now here comes the good part. And before we do this, I want you to, as, as I read this psalm, this it's titled in my book, A, a Psalm of Thanksgiving, um, which Jonah prays from the belly of the whale. So part of this is kind of satire that Jonah, who has become himself the sacrifice, is thanking God um, for the fact that he could sacrifice himself and then be rescued by this fish. Um, but I want you to recall, if you've studied Genesis with me before, you'll know this, but if you haven't, uh, let me describe this to you. And then when we get in a couple of weeks, when we get to Genesis, this will all be old news to you. But the idea in the ancient world, and I wish I had a whiteboard or something. I, I'm not good enough with how to do this on Facebook Live. But the, in the ancient world, the picture of the world was that on either end of the world, there were mountains, okay? And then from the top of the mountains, there was like this dome that was held up by these two mountains. Okay, I mean, we're not talking about a round world here. We're talking about the world being flat. So mountain, mountain, and then the dome over the mountain. The dome is the dome of the sky. And there were little pricks in the dome that allowed the light from the heavens to go through the dome by stars and sun and any light that came from the celestial dome, okay? And at the foot of the two mountains was the sea, the water, okay, whatever kind of water. And wherever ground was, it was all floating, okay? And everything else was water. So they were aware that water was big 
and probably much bigger than they had the concept of land. So more water than land. And if um, sometimes there would be like geysers of water that would come up and that's how the earth got watered or sometimes the dome would open and water would come down. So that's how water got onto the land. But now here we're going to get kind of a little picture of the, the thought was that Sheol or the underworld was like a walled city underwater. And that's where bad people went or what people went, you know, when they died, especially if they fell into the ocean and died, they went to Sheol, which was this, as I say, a gated city. So you've got this kind of world view of what creation looks like that this Thanksgiving prayer kind of comes from it. You'll see it as I as I read the prayer. This is so the end of one in verse 17. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Hmm. Three days and three nights. Hmm. That seems to be a re re repeating phrase or a repeating concept. So um, I'm hoping you're catching those kinds of things when you hear them now. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship idol, vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. That's pretty cool. So there's Jonah sitting on the beach right about where he started, covered with fish guts and vomit. Doesn't that sound like fun? Um, and kind of just still not buying into the God thing here. Still, it's sort of, this is sort of sarcastic. Um, my prayer when I come into your holy temple, you know, he says he knows that that's where sacrifices are offered to God at the temple in Jerusalem. And though even though he knows he's far away from that place of worship, he knew that God would hear his prayer. So he's still, I think, a little ticked off at God, that God would ask him to go to Nineveh. And here's where I want to tell you just a little bit about, I think, Part of his animosity towards Nineveh was that it was part, it was the large city of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, as I said, had, were the ones who had taken the northern kingdom into captivity. Um, so Jonah is still holding a big grudge uh, to Assyria and to those who took his people away. Some of the themes of the story, though, really are things um, that were themes of literature that was written about the same time, Ezra and Nehemiah which are both about the return from captivity back to um, the, the promise to rebuild the temple and to reestablish the northern kingdom and uh, Israel and the city of Samaria. So we're, we're kind of washing around in time here according to this story, which is one of the th reasons why this is not supposed to be history. It's supposed to be a teaching parable. So, okay. I don't see any questions. So let me move forward on the conversion of Nineveh. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, and this should sound familiar, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. 
Now, isn't that interesting? The first time he said he, he was using language about, you know, they need to repent. They're in big trouble. I'm sending you to warn them. And now this language has changed a little bit. He's still going to the same place, the great city, but now he has a message that God's going to tell him. Okay. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city and going, uh, began to go into the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small Put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the kings and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Okay, so we've got, um, oh, let me, I got a little note here. I like, Pam says, I like the images you discuss. It seemed to me to be similar to the happenings on Good Friday. Oh, good. The casting of lots for Jesus' robe. <laughs> Maybe that was just a movie. No, it was not. Call on your God, if you are God, save yourself in the New Testament. Storm curtain of the temple. Uh, ripped and Jesus in the tomb, the belly of the fish for three days. Very good, Pam. So this is one of the, yeah, this is would be, would be one of the echoes. Actually, it probably would be more echoing from New Testament to Old Testament. But now we're here in the Old Testament and we're, we're bouncing it back on the New Testament. So when people talk about the consistency of scripture, this is the kind of thing they're thinking about. This is, a, what they're, this is a really good example of that, that these kinds of stories and the way that they were told and interpreted fed into other stories from the past and stories that were to come. Uh, so that when those stories happened, there was this, what I call the echo, you know, there was this familiarity uh, with the way the story unfolds and what's going to happen and who's the who's the good guy and who's the bad guy and and how it's going to to work itself out. So good call, Pam. That's that was a that's a great comment. Um, so going back to chapter three. Um, this time when Jonah goes and it's you know it's kind of like he started out in you know he started out where he was a little north of Joppa, and then you know. God says, go to Nineveh. And he goes, yeah, okay. And then he goes south and turns right instead of turning left. Um, so he gets out into the ocean and then the fish picks him up and brings him back to where he started. So, you know, it's like God says, no, 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 wait, you, you must have misunderstood me because I said, go to Nineveh, which is that way, not that way. So he gets, um, you know, Jonah himself gets another chance to do what God has asked him to do. So Nineveh, a three days walk. He was just three days in the belly of the whale. So he's kind of purifying himself. This, And again, here's another echo. When Peter comes to Jesus um, on the seashore after the resurrection and Jesus asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Um, is to erase the, the threefold denial that he has, has um, that happened when they were in the courtyard of the high priest and he denied knowing Christ three times. So we have this kind of, um, you know, for three days in the belly of the whale, now you are purging that, 
from you for walking for three days. So the city was three days across. So he had to walk out three days and come back three days. Um, and then also the reference to 40 days um, warning. So there are 40 days of preparation for Nineveh to turn around, to change its evil ways. Um, so here's the warning. You got 40 days. You got Lent. And if you do the right thing, Easter will happen. If you don't do the right thing, we're going to stop at Good Friday. You know, so uh, they have this, this opportunity to change. And then this great, again, another reversal, like, you know, at the very beginning where it said, and Jonah, but Jonah didn't do what God said. And here's the other reversal now. And the people of Nineveh, you would expect, said, who cares? You know, this is not our God. But instead, they said they believed. They believed God. They proclaimed a fast, which is a Jewish ritual. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. So they're talking about sackcloth and ashes and fasting. These are Jewish rituals of repentance. So it's like they just, not only did they believe God, they just threw all in with Jonah and what the, the Jews would have done. Now, how did they know how to do that? Well, they had had the people, the Jewish people in captivity. So some of these rites and rituals might have been either transferred into the culture or had been picked up. Um, along the way so that the, the people of Nineveh were at least familiar with how you go about repenting before the Godhead. So they do that. And then when the, the news reaches the king of Nineveh, he gets himself off of his throne, takes off his royal symbols of the robe, covers himself with sackcloth, and sits in ashes. So he's, he's basically humbling himself from sitting on a throne to sitting in ashes and saying, you know, this is my, this is the way I will repent. And then he proclaims a fast throughout the kingdom. Um, and everybody did it. All shall turn, all shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. And he suggests, who knows, God may relent and change his mind and he may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. And then I love this passage, and I have used this many, many times when people say, um, God, because we learned in confirmation is, you know, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, you know, all those omni words, that God doesn't change, that God is steadfast, that God never, you know, once God says something, there's no flexibility in that. And here it's very clear, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind. That's pretty clear. God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So maybe God was hoping against hope that they would repent, and sure enough, look at here, they did. So he didn't have to do, uh, he didn't have to use the stick. He used the invitation to repentance and forgiveness and showed mercy on the people of Nineveh. So any questions about that? Do you ever think about God changing his mind? I think a lot of times people think, you know, once God says it, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But I like the idea that God is flexible enough to change his mind. And then you think back to the story of Abraham, uh, where he is arguing with God about destroying a, a city. And he says, well, what if there, are, you know, what if there are 10, you know, and, and you know, God says, okay, for 10 believers, you know, I won't destroy the city. Well, what if there are six, you know, and he, and he works him all the way down. What if there's just one? And God says, for one believer, I will save the town. You know, so, so Abraham and, and, and God have had these kinds of discussions where God barters and where God's mind is changed. So we see, uh, you know, not a, a static kind of God that definitely God is, is moving and shaping and reimagining and responding to situations and that sort of thing. So um, we get a lot of different pictures of the Godhead, I think, throughout the Hebrew Bible that we maybe don't get quite as many images um, in the New Testament, or maybe we've just stultified the stories in the New Testament a little bit more than, than we have in the Jewish Bible, just because we know it better. So anyway, keep that in mind. God can change his mind. So, um, any questions, anything else? Everybody's 
Everybody's hanging in there. So let's do chapter four. Uh, so God changed his mind and about the calamity and he didn't do it. Okay, that would be a good thing, right? Now Jonah has accomplished what God had sent him to do. Everything is amazing, you know, and, and God is happy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I see that. Yeah, it, it was in Esther, the phrase, who knows, um, who knows if this wasn't the time, you know, if, if you weren't called here for just such a time as this. So yeah, that who knows thing is, is, a, is a recurring phrase. You're getting good at finding those echoes, Pam. Good for you. So let's move on with chapter four. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relate, relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The end. Um, I think this is a great, this last passage is just wonderful because, you know, you go through this whole thing. Jonah, by the grace of God, has been able to accomplish what God wanted him to do in Nineveh by, uh, you know, converting 120,000 or whatever people in Nineveh to doing God's will. You would think that Jonah would be just delighted, but he's one of those grumpsters, you know. It's like he didn't like the Ninevites. He never liked the Ninevites. He wasn't ever going to like the Ninevites. And the fact that God gave them mercy and, you know, and cause the, you know, that his wrath would be moved away from them. That just tipped Jonah over. It's like, it just might as well kill me. Just might as well kill me. I mean, if these, you know, scums of the earth Ninevites can get mercy from you, then, then I'm done. You know, I, I don't understand it. I don't like it. And I'm just, you know, take me, take me now. So he's, you know, you know, God says, why are you angry? And he just leaves and he goes out of the city. He walks away from God again, you know. So my, isn't, think about how this is the story of the people of Israel. You know, God does something wonderful for them and they get, you know, they get angry or they walk away or they flee or they, you know, they never just sit down and say, God, that was amazing. And man, was, have I been a jerk? You, know, you don't see those kinds of stories very often. So Jonah leaves God, goes out of the city, and sits down to the east of the city, further away, okay, and makes a booth for himself there. So a little, you know, a little shelter, a little lean-to. And he sits under it in the shade, waiting to see what will become of the city. So he's like, he's stewing, he's ruminating, he's sitting watching 
hoping against hope that God will change his mind again and send fire raining down on Nineveh. And that's, that's the only thing that seems is going to make him happy. So he does that. And then, and then it's like, you know, hear this, the phrase, kill him with kindness. I think this is one of those places where God's like, okay, okay, Jonah, watch this. You know, he appoints a bush. Okay. So he appoints, he says, bush, I'm appointing you. I'm calling you to go shade. All right. So he points the bush, makes it come up over Jonah to give shade to his head and to save him from his discomfort. Isn't that sweet? So Jonah is so happy about the bush. You know, he was so angry to the, that he was willing to die, and yet he can still be happy about the bush that shades him. But then when dawn comes the next day, God appoints a worm, and the worm comes and the, and the bush withers. So now Jonah has to deal with the heat of the day. You know, he's just had an example of how God would care for him if he would just let him. But no, Jonah is so faint and says, that's it, I'm done. I, you know, I don't care if you love me. I don't care. I'm, you know, I just, it's just too much that my enemies have received your mercy and I'm just done. And so God says, is it right for you to be angry? Here again, there's an echo of this in the parable that Jesus tells about the workers in the app, you know, that, that are paid those who are, and they're paid the same amount, even if they started at late in the day. Uh, and then the people who got the early, you know, who had to work through the heat of the day and work the whole day got the same amount as those who came at the end. It's that same kind of thing. It's like, you know, oh, grace is great. You know, I want God's grace for everybody, except for the guy across the street who just drives me crazy. You know, grace is good as long as it's grace for you. Um, but somehow that those kinds of stories are, um, you know, God doesn't care what you think about his grace. God doesn't care how you understand it or how you receive it. Um, you know, God's just going to do it. It's the seed that goes out on the thorns, on the, on the path, you know, on the rocks, the mercy comes, God just provides it. Um, hello, Roxana, how you doing? So, um, and then here's the way it ends, which I just love. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? So the reader is put into the position of answering the question, how would you answer God if you were Jonah? Would that be enough? to make Jonah relent and say, ah, what a fool I've been. 120,000 people who now love you, who now understand who you are, who have received your mercy and grace in a graceful manner. And isn't that amazing? And I got to take part in that. Or, yeah, kill me now. It's not enough. I don't care. <laughs> I know what I wish Jonah would say. But is, this is one of those where the story stops just short and it really, really encourages you to respond to the story um, in the way that you wish Jonah would. So, um, okay. Any other questions? Okay. It's hard to do a whole hour on some of these stories without having the conversation. So, um, so anyway, that's... That is what I have to say about Jonah. And I think next week, um, I do want to do Micah because it has been very important and it's very uh, important in, um, you know, in our conversations about justice and in our conversations about what God uh, requires of us or what God expects of us. So, um I think we will go ahead and do Micah. Micah only has seven chapters, and it's mostly verse. Um, so I can do, I'll give you a little background on that. I don't think most of us have ever really studied and gotten involved in Micah and that passage. Again, Micah is another one of the prophets um, who came from the northern kingdom. And um, and so when you, when, you know, when you have this chance to, to get some of these prophets who were living at the same time and, and writing, after the exile. So people have come back and they're trying to start over. 
um, that kind of rings a little bit differently now as we continue to try to start over. Um, but most of us are trying to start over the way things were. And I think that never really works out well in scripture. Um, so trying, trying to go back and recapture what has passed. Um, I think we'll see that a lot as we look into Micah. Rachel Line, hello to you. Thank you for being with us. And uh, next time you see your mom, greet her for me. Okay, so that's all I have to say for you today. You get off so you can go out and sit. I don't. I hope it's not too hot since we had the nice rain. And I hope the weather in in uh, so Southern California is treating you well, Ms. Line. Okay. I will see you all next week, or if you're one of my devoter, devotional people, I'll see you in the morning. And also, um, please let me know if you're interested in sitting in on the conversations that we're having over the Waking Up White um, book. And uh, if you want to be in on that Zoom, Zoom meeting tomorrow night at 7, just send me a text or a note. Tell me you want to be included, and I'll send you the invitation to the Zoom. So thanks for being with me. Have a great day, and I'll see you around. Oh. And Jonas just stays sulking under a dead bush. The end. Yeah. And Jonah just stays sulking. You know, it doesn't say that he ever washed, you know, so covered in covered in fish vomit and sweat from going across town and maybe a little ash here and there and sulking under a dead bush. The end. What a lovely way to end this Bible study. Have a great day. Blessings on all of you. Bye-bye.